Today is the Sunday of the Litany of the Palms and Passion Sunday. And so we have two gospel readings appointed for this day. The first gospel text comes from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. When they had come near Jerusalem and had re reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them and sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Here ends the Gospel of the Litany of the Palms. We now shift to the Gospel of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 27th chapter. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus, who was called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, see to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his clothes back on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They called upon this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. 
but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, He who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am the Son of God. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again in a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, They were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. This is the gospel of our Lord. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Well, this Sunday has two polar opposite themes. If we could gather together, we'd start outside under the portico with the litany of the palms. We would reenact Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem by carrying our palm branches and parading into the church, singing all glory, laud, and honor to you, Redeemer King. After all the pomp and circumstance was over, we would begin to read the other scripture readings appointed for Palm slash Passion Sunday. In place of the sermon, we would have a dramatic reading of the story of the passion and death of Jesus. I always make note on this particular Sunday that it seems to me like it should be called Fickle Sunday because we go from giving glory, laud, and honor to Jesus to shouts of, let him be crucified, all within a pretty short span, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So this year, Palm and Passion Sunday is a bit strange to me for more than one reason. First, we're not together, acting all fickle. And second, I actually get to deliver the gospel via a sermon, which I have never done on Palm Sunday, um, because it's normally omitted as we do our dramatic reading of the Passion story. I really love the way We normally read the Passion Story on Sunday, on this Sunday in the church year. Rob Arling, who's our uh, um, coordinator for all the lectors, he lines up someone to play each of the speaking parts. Someone plays Peter and Pilate, and even the servants and the centurion guards have speaking parts. My favorite part is when the whole congregation shouts, Crucify him! I know that's pretty weird. for that to be my fave, uh, but this is one Sunday of the year 
when we're all really encouraged to put ourselves into the various characters in the story. So here's the way I look at it. Yes, there is someone who identifies with Peter, someone who might have turned their back on Jesus or the church for whatever reason. And so they identify with Peter's struggle and with his weeping after he has denied the Lord. And someone else, well, they might see themselves as one of the disciples when Jesus announces, one of you will betray me. And you ask yourself, is it me, Lord? Someone else might think of himself as Barabbas, the one who was set free by the suffering of Jesus. We don't want to admit it, but we're more like Judas and Peter or the crowd than we like to think. They are all of us. How many times a day do our thoughts, words, and deeds, all the things we do and all the things we fail to do, convey our true intent? Every day, every one of us, in so many big and small ways, we betray our Lord. But here's the good news for you. Jesus came for you. He came with a specific intent to save sinners, all those who betray him, all those who deny him, and yes, even all of us whose sins shout out every day, let him be crucified. Jesus' suffering, death, and his resurrection, they were all for you. He did it so your slate could be wiped clean. Not like the old blackboards in classrooms from the days when I went to school. Back then, when the teacher would erase the board, you could still read what was previously written there. Your sin is not like that. Um, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, your sin is wiped cleaner than, well, it's wiped cleaner than Hillary Clinton's emails from her hard drive. I know that joke's a little dated, but there it is. Scripture says God separates us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. Someone once asked, well, how far is that, Pastor? Imagine Jesus on the cross with his arms stretched out on either side and his hands nailed to the cross. That's how far God separates us from our sin. Scripture says God goes even one step further. Through the passion and resurrection of Jesus, God remembers our sin no more. God walls off a portion of his divine memory and declares selective amnesia. When God looks at you, all God sees is his perfect child, blemish-free and righteous. God sees you in the light of his only son, Jesus Christ. God doesn't see all the times we, stray, we stayed in bed rather than come to worship him. God doesn't see that time when your friend told a joke that put down another racial group and not only did you not stop him, but you laughed at someone else's expense. God doesn't remember all the times when you had the chance to praise him, but remain silent instead. God doesn't remember all those times when you washed your hands of him, like Pilate. He doesn't even remember all the neighbors that we could have helped, but chose to feather our own nest instead. No, God doesn't remember any of those things, because when God looks at you and me, all God sees is the image of his son on a cross. How I wish I could be with you and we could all be together to act out the passion of our Lord today. Sadly, we're all appropriately socially distanced in order to protect each other from an invisible disease. I thank God Jesus wasn't afraid to join us in our real true disease. Jesus knew how infected the human race was to sin, and yet he came to become one of us anyway. Our sinful condition didn't catch Jesus by surprise like the coronavirus caught so many governments around the world completely unaware. 
Jesus knew before he left his heavenly place with God to come to this earth as a baby exactly what he was getting himself into. He knew there was no other way for God's children to survive. He knew there was no other way than to come here himself to get his hands dirty, so to speak, and to save us from ourselves, from the grip of sin, death, and the devil. We're now entering into the holiest week of the church year. This is the week we remember the saving acts of God. On Thursday, Jesus washed his feet from the, uh, of his disciples, and he instituted the sacrament of Holy Communion. On Friday, Good Friday, Jesus paid the ultimate price for our sin by hanging on a cross that you and I deserved. On Holy Saturday, Jesus descended into hell to preach the good news to all the souls who had lived and died before. On that glorious Easter morning, he was raised from the dead, breaking the lock Satan had on all of us. We're going to find new and creative ways to commemorate these saving actions of God without gathering together. I will have a premier gospel reading and a homily from Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday on this very same YouTube channel right here at 7 o'clock p.m. on each of those nights. We can gather also electronically for the gospel and a sermon on Easter Sunday at the normal time of 10.30 a.m. on this same YouTube channel. We will get through this this time of being apart. There will be a time, hopefully in the not too distant future, when we will be able to gather together as church family once again. Until then, I choose to think of this time apart as a sort of fast. During Lent, people fast from all kinds of things. When Lent is over, those things that we've denied ourselves seems so much more delightful. And that's exactly what will happen when we can gather again to worship and to praise our God all with one voice. Over the years, God's people have been apart from the things they love many times. In the Old Testament, um, it talks about the time of the exile when the Babylonians demanded that the Israelites sing one of those songs of Zion. And their reply was, how can we sing those wonderful songs that we once sang in the temple when we're now exiled in a foreign land? But after they were allowed to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild their temple, they worshiped their God in total ecstasy. My dear church, we must consider ourselves exiled, maybe not in a foreign land, maybe in the familiar confines of our own homes, but the time is coming, and very soon, when we won't be sad anymore. I'm not talking about when this quarantine or this sheltering in place is over. No, I'm talking about that day when Jesus calls us all and when the last trumpet blows, when God's kingdom finally arrives in the fullness of God's glory. On that day, we will all sing a new song, and it'll be a song of joy. Until that day, let's join the people who lined the roads leading into the Eastern Gate of Jerusalem on this Sunday so many years ago, when they laid their garments down and they cut branches from trees and they all shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. I used to think the word Hosanna was a praise word sort of like alleluia, but it really means God save us. How appropriate for the times we're going through right now. Hosanna, God save us. May that day of God's glory come quickly. Thanks be to God for giving himself selective amnesia and remembering our sin no more. May the presence of God and his Holy Spirit be with us and strengthen us 
during this present day exile. May God's healing spirit be upon each one who is sick with this coronavirus and with every other disease. Until the day when God's glory shines on every one of God's children, may we each be little Christs for one another. May God's face shine upon you. May God look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.